Happy New Year. Thank you so much for joining me this year. It's going to be a fantastic year. Expect the unexpected, expect the expected, and expect the impossible. Come back and I'll share with you how to order your year correctly so that by the time you get to December, it's been a successful, positive year. So come back. This year, 2013, is the year when God wants you to expect a harvest. But how do, you, how do you expect for a harvest? How do you prepare to have a harvest? Well, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to prioritize our lives, the things that need to be first. In other words, putting first things first. Now, as a church, at the beginning of every year, even though um, you're seeing the program and we're already in January, as a church, we do two things every year at the beginning of the year. The first thing we do is we present or we bring our first fruits. Now that's based in the word of God throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. We find scriptures about first fruits. And the one that I want to bring to your attention today is found in Proverbs chapter 3 and it's in verse 9. And this is what it says. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So what we do is we start the year by honoring God with what comes into our hands first. First things first. And then the second thing we do as a church is we have a church fast. And this morning I want to talk a little bit about fasting. The purpose, the power, and how to fast. Uh, fasting is so important. And so let's start first and foremost by talking about last year. It's a new year, but we need to look at last year. If you found yourself last year in, in a scenario or situation where you know that God was, this was not God's will, that this was not ordained by God, or if you found yourself or if you have um, family members that don't know Jesus, that are not born again, or if you have kids that are into drugs, or, or if you have family members that's into things that's deadly. In other words, they're not committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, fasting and praying is a powerful way of breaking the power of the enemy from over their lives. You see, the way the enemy works is he wants to steal, to kill, and destroy. So what he does is he works first and foremost in the mind. And that's where fasting comes in, because when you fast, what you do is you you Get your body quiet. Fasting helps your body to be quiet because the, the organs start, they, they're at rest. You know, if you continue to eat and eat and eat and eat, your body never has an opportunity to rest. And that's what many times causes problems in our bodies. Our bodies need to rest. Physically, not just uh, on the outside, not just sleeping, but also inside. Our organs need to have an opportunity to rest. And so we see in the Word of God, that the children of Israel, they fasted for different reasons. And now let me share this with you. God is the same. The way he was yesterday is the same way he is today. He never changes. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Humanity has not changed. Man is still fighting and battling the flesh. The spirit still uh, versus the flesh. The flesh is still battling the spirit. That's humanity. That's man. That's the believer. That's the spirit of the believer wanting to ascend over the flesh, and the flesh is fighting. And of course, the devil is the same. He wants to kill you. That's the bottom line. The way he does it, he steals, he destroys, and ultimately his goal is to kill you. So how, why, why should we fast? Let's, let's look at some reasons that we saw the children of Israel, as well as the church in the New Testament, the, 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 in the, in the uh, Gospels and Acts, uh, the book of Acts. Let's look at some of the reasons they fasted, okay? First and foremost, if we look at before I get to that, let's look at Matthew chapter 5, because this is a crucial scripture. Many people think, many believers think that 
they have the choice or the option of fasting, but that's not according to the word of God. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, well, let's start from Matthew chapter 6, I'm sorry. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. Now, what I want you to see there in Matthew chapter 6, verse 16, he doesn't say, if you fast, he says, when you fast. So in other words, you're supposed to be fasting. So that's the first thing. And then he gives specific instructions in terms of how to fast. Then, now, let's look at Matthew chapter 5. Let's start at verse 1 and verse 2. It says, And seeing the multitude, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying... Now, what I want you to see here is that Jesus has called uh, the multitudes together, his disciples, and as they come together, and he sits down, and then he starts to teach them. So what he's teaching them are principles... uh, things of the kingdom that he wants them or that they have to walk in or that they need to walk in. And one of those things he talks about in Matthew chapter 6. Actually, the, this discourse, this teaching that Jesus does with his disciples, it goes from Matthew chapter 5 to about Matthew chapter 7 or so. Or Ma- I know it includes all of Matthew chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 7. And so, He's speaking to them, and in this discourse, he talks about prayer, he talks about fasting, um, he talks about giving, he talks about everything pertaining to life. And so when it comes down to fasting, because now he's speaking to his disciples, when it comes down to fasting, he tells them, he says, when you fast, he doesn't say, if you fast. So of all the reasons, there are many reasons to fast, but but of all the reasons to fast, The primary one should be that you're a disciple. You're honoring him. You're doing what he says to do. So it says, and when you fast, moreover, on top of, well, when you fast, he tells you, number one, don't be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. So let's look at the different reasons that they fasted in the Bible. Now, you're a disciple of Christ. You're a born-again believer. So it's not a matter of if, it's when. Now, when do you fast? Let's look at that. Well, first and foremost, we see healing. Um, David, in 2 Samuel chapter 12, he fasted for um, his son that he um, got through murder and adultery. Um, He fasted. Um, interceding, asking God to spare the child's life. He fasted and prayed. Then when we look at Second Chronicles chapter 20, another reason for fasting is when you're in trouble. So let's look at that one. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verse 3. And I'll tell you, we'll start with verse 1 actually. It says, it happened after this, that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them besides the Ammonites. So there are at least three uh, nationalities, three nations that have come together. And it says they came to battle against Jehoshaphat. They came to battle against Judah. Judah. Then it says, then some came and told Jehoshaphat saying, a great multitude is coming against you. From beyond the sea, um, which is En Gedi. And the word of God tells us in verse 3, it says, And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaim a fast throughout all Judah. Notice that Jehoshaphat fasted. He stood still. He fasted and he prayed. And he called the whole assembly of Judah to come and pray. The tendency today is if you have trouble, is to flee, to run away from it. The tendency today, if you have trouble, is to quit and to give up. That's the spirit of this world. The spirit of this world wants you to quit. The spirit of this world wants you to give up. 
But praise God, God has made a way that you can get the divine direction from him in trouble. That if you seek him, if you fast and pray, you will actually hear the voice of the spirit of God. Or you also, or another way God talks to us is by the inner voice, that still small voice. He'll communicate with you the direction you should go in. But don't let the spirit of this world dictate to you how you should live because of trouble. Because there'll always be trouble. So what's going to happen the next time you have trouble? You're going to run someplace else? No, you have to stand your ground, seek God, get direction, fast and pray and you'll get your deliverance, just like Jehoshaphat did. And you know what's so wonderful about this story, um, about this event, this, this um, incident that took place, is they fasted and they prayed. They sought God, and you know what God said? He said, this battle, I'm going to fight it. That's what you want. You want God to fight your battles for you. Because listen, you're in yourself. The Bible says that Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. So you might as well just, just give up the arm of flesh. Stop trying to do it in your own power. Can't you see? Nothing is happening. Nothing is working. Fast and pray and see the salvation of God. This is what's so wonderful of this incident where they fasted and prayed when the enemy came against them. When trouble came. Look at what the word of God says. It says in verse 25, it says, uh, first of all, what happened was the, the, the enemy got, got rid of the enemy, which he's good at doing. And it says in verse 24, so when Judah came to a place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude and there were their dead bodies. There were their dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. Basically, they killed each other. Then it says, when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days gathering the spoil because there was so much. See what you're missing out on? If you run away, don't run from trouble. Stand still and see the salvation of God. Fast and pray. And what will happen is, and one of the other uh, benefits of fasting and praying, one of the outcomes is you get strength inside. So many times we try to fight and we try to, to use our own strength. And what happens? We get worn out. We get sick. We get depressed. We get distressed. We get tr more trouble. Stop. Stop. Fast and pray. And let God speak to you. He wants to speak to you more than you want to listen. Okay, so let's, let's look at another one. In Esther chapter 4, verse 3, what we see there is that there's a man by the name of Haman who's motivated by the devil. And uh, because Esther's uncle doesn't, give, doesn't bow to him, because Esther's uncle doesn't bow to him, he's angry and he hates him. Such intense hate that you try to get rid of a whole nation. That's demonic. And the word of God tells us, and it says in Esther chapter 4 verse 3, it says, And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. What I want to do is I just want to read to you from, from verse 1. Because what I read you was uh, around verse 6. It says in verse 1. After these things, King Asuserus promoted Haman, the son of Hamedatha, <laughs> the Agatite, and advanced him and set his seat above all the princes who were with him. And all the king's servants who were within the king's gate bowed and paid homage to Haman, for so the king had commanded concerning him. But you see, Haman was evil, and, and Mordecai knew that. And it says, but Mordecai would not bow or pay homage. Then the king's servants who were within the king's gate said to Mordecai, why do you transgress the king's command? 
Now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them that they told it to Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand for Mordecai had told them that he was a Jew. Now this is what's so interesting. Mordecai already has trouble with Haman because he refuses to bow to him. But the king's men, the servants, they instigated it more by, look at what they did. It says they told Haman that Mordecai would not bow to him. It says, now it happened when they spoke to him daily and he would not listen to them, that they told Haman to see whether Mordecai's words would stand. All they had to do was keep them out shut. So what they did was they added more insult to the injury of Haman. And so it says, when Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow or pay him homage, Haman was filled with wrath. And it says, he disdained to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had told him of the people of Mordecai. Instead, Haman sought to destroy all the Jews who were throughout the whole kingdom of Astuceras, the people of Mordecai. So what Haman did is his hatred for Mordecai went even beyond Mordecai to the point that he wanted to destroy and get rid of all of the Jews. And so Mordecai tells his niece, Esther, who um, was chosen by the king, who became the king's wife, basically. And um, she's the, the thing about it is that in that position she was in, you're not allowed to go before the king unless he calls for you. And he hadn't called for her. So she was taking a chance to, to go to see him. So what she did was she told the people to fast and pray. And now when the, the nation of Israel found out that this was the plan that all the Jews were going to be destroyed, according to the king's command, what they all did was, it, and I read it here in uh, Esther 4, 3, it says that they had great mourning, they were fasting, they were weeping, and they were wailing. And then on top of that, they had on sackcloth and ashes. So they fasted and prayed. And here again, as a result of them fasting and praying, God turned their captivity around. And instead of the Jews being um, uh, slaughtered by the king, what happened was Haman and his entire family were destroyed. So here again, don't run from trouble. Stand and see the salvation of God. And then to those of you on the other side, you watch out when you mess with a child of God because the hand of God is strong on, on behalf of those who, whose heart is towards him. Another uh, example of uh, trouble we find in Acts chapter 27, and uh, that's verse 33. And that's when, uh, I believe it's Peter, was uh, in prison. The word of God tells us that prayer was made for him continually. Let me see. I'm sorry, not, not Acts 27. Um, but there, there's the, the incident of where uh, Peter was imprisoned and the word of God tells us that prayer was made for him continually by the church. So much so that when Peter, the, the angel came and delivered Peter and Peter went to the house where they were praying for him all night. And when Rhoda saw Peter, she couldn't believe it was him. She said it was a spirit. Uh, she didn't even have faith in the prayers that they were praying. So God delivered them in, tr delivered Peter as a result of the church's prayer. Peter was in trouble and God delivered him. Now, another um, time we see fasting taking place is in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21 and 20 to 23. It says, and, and that's for direction. It says, then I proclaimed a fast. And this is Ezra. He proclaimed a fast at the river Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him the right way for us and our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request of the king an escort of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy on the road because we had spoken to the king saying the hand of our God is upon all those for good who seek him. So we fasted and entreated our God for this and he answered our prayer. So they fasted, Ezra fasted for direction and God answered him. And I want you to see this. Ezra put his faith in God, not in God protecting them, not in asking the king for soldiers to go with them. 
And then another one, when you're in distress and repentance, we find in Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 4, when Nehemiah heard the report that the wall of Jerusalem was broken down and that the gates were burnt with fire, the word of God tells us, so it was, Nehemiah said, when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days, I was fasting and praying before the God of heaven. So here again, for when you're in distress and also repentance, Joel chapter 2 verse 12 and 15, we see that the children of Israel are called to repentance because of their sins. Here again, the, the, the history with Israel was they walk with God, they sinned, <laughs> they repented, and God turned their captivity. So they're in sin now, and so they, they're seeking God because the enemy now has come in, and God hears their captivity. In this, what we're seeing is they're praying and they're repenting. And then we have another, uh, another reason for fasting, and that's for understanding. In Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, Daniel reads out of the book of Jeremiah, and he saw that, that something was supposed to happen at a certain time period for the children of Israel, and it hadn't happened as yet. So the word of God tells us that Daniel fasted and prayed. And I want to look at that. Daniel chapter 9, verse 3, it says, Then I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer and supplications with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. So we see that that's what Daniel does. He seeks God. And what we find is that Daniel gets a response to his prayer. He gets understanding to the prayer that he prayed. And that's found in Daniel chapter 9, verse 22. It says, and actually the angel Gabriel appeared to him. And he says, now while I was speaking, praying, this is Daniel, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. So here again, understanding. So if you need, if you're in trouble, if you need understanding, if you're in distress, if you need direction, then we also find if you need to cast out a demon, if you have a family member living with you that has a demon in them that's demon possessed, you fasting and praying in Mark chapter 9, verse 29, and Matthew chapter 17, verse 21, where he informs the, the, his disciples, the apostles, the reason they couldn't cast out that devil was because fasting and prayer was required. Matthew 17, 21. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. And then, this is one I think that's just so wonderful. God doesn't hide anything from his children. In Luke chapter 2, verse 37, what we see is if you live a fasted life, you will know things before they happen. God will reveal to you things before they happen. We find other scriptures where God speaks uh, and they're able to, to hear him uh, speak to them because of their fasting and praying in Acts chapter 14, verse 23. He ordains ministers. We find in Acts 13, 2, that the Holy Spirit, the word of God tells us in Acts 13, 2, it says, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Barnabas and Saul, Paul for the work whereunto I have called them. So, when you fast and you pray, you're bringing power into your life that takes you outside of the realm of the natural. It takes you outside of the realm of reasoning. It takes you into that place of standing your ground. It opens you up to receiving direction from on high. It gives you the ability to use the power that God has placed within you to cast out demons and bring deliverance not only to yourself but to people around you you can get direction through fasting and praying it is so important 
fasting and praying. And if you do this at the beginning of the year, you set the course, you set a pace for your life for the rest of the year. Bring in your first fruits and fasting and praying. Now, something else we saw in the, in the Bible, when the presence of God was removed from the children of Israel, and it's the, the removal of the presence of God is called Ichabod. The word of God tells us that the children of Israel, that they fasted and they prayed and they mourned and they cried. And this is what's so important for us today in the time that we're living in is we have to make sure that we have the presence of God. You have to recognize the presence of God in your life. It's a shame for his presence, not for you not to, as a believer, not to even know his presence isn't there. So fasting and praying is so important. When you fast and pray, you're heightened, your, your senses, your spiritual senses are heightened and more aware of his presence. The battle between the spirit and the flesh is fought through fasting and praying and the word of God. Prayer, fasting, the word of God, it puts hope into you if you're facing tests and trials. It puts hope into you so that you can face every situation that comes along your path. It gives you, and, and the thing with this, once you've got hope, then your faith is there. Your faith is alive. It's still alive. So this day, choose to fast. We're, as a church, we're fasting from January 14th to February 3rd. We've already started fasting, but you can come on board. So January 14th through February 3rd, we're fasting. So if even though it's, it, the, you're seeing this after January 14th, you can still join us. And then something else to, also too is Monday through Friday from 6.30 to 7.30, we are at our location, 105 Belongo Bay, and we are praying. We are seeking God's face. We are fasting and we are praying. Listen, if you are not going to pray and if you are not going to get into the word, if you're not going to give yourself more time for prayer and more time for the word, then you don't need to fast. Because if you fast without that foundation of the word of God and prayer, you're opening up yourself to to, to a world and a realm that you have no authority over. So I'm encouraging you, fast and pray. Fast, pray, and the word. And then one more thing I want to share with you is I'm doing a juice fast. Everyone is encouraged to, to give up something. And so I, like for instance, today I have my hibiscus tea room temperature with a squeeze of lemon in it. Just natural things that you can put into your system uh, that'll be a blessing to your body. So don't forget, fasting and praying January 14th to February 3rd, Monday through Friday, 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. We're over at Belongo, 105 Belongo, praying, seeking God so that we can set the pace and the course of this year. Don't forget your first fruits and please fast and pray. Amen. Have a wonderful week. God bless you.